There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Friday Reads and you can actually see some books in the background. Wow. Do I look tired? I, I, I think so. I am really tired today. It's been a fairly busy week and I've had a fairly busy morning. I got up and did a taping of the Reading Envy podcast bright and early and then I just spent uh, almost an hour wrapping books to mail off to many of you, my lovely Booktube buddies, and I had... I've thrown it away in favor of this one, but the roll of packing tape that I was using, I swear, every time, you know, there it is, you can pull it off the next time. But the other one, it kept getting flat, and then it was like surgery with your fingernails trying to get it up. Like it took 10 minutes every time, and it would always lay flat. And I was like, ah, so garbage, and I had one more in this one. It's much more was much more cooperative. That's the kind of day it's been. So I am really happy to be here and calm down and tell you about my reading week, most, most of which will calm me down. A couple of reminiscences might uh, exacerbate my current state of frazzlement, but let's begin, shall we? I have two bales to tell you about. Neither, of, I think, will surprise you if you followed last Friday reads. The first was The Spire by William Golding. This was so mind-numbingly boring. There was a buddy read. There was four of us. And three of us bailed. <laughs> but left poor Tina all by herself. She's doing a very solitary, very lonely buddy read of The Spire because the rest of us thought it was really dull as ditch water. I didn't like the writing. The sentence structure was needlessly complex and I had found myself having to go back and reread sentences at least twice to follow the meaning. Now William Golding can could write. Lord of the Flies was beautifully written, I thought, but this was clunky and the characters were not only unlikable, which I don't doesn't bother me. There's been a new quite a lot of talk on booktube about unlikable characters, but also deeply uninteresting. So yeah. Big disappointment. I didn't have particularly high hopes about it. It's just that I expected to like it because of how much I love Lord of the Flies. But no, this was no good. And despite me raising my hand to you all and promising Electra and you that I wouldn't bail on the Leonard Cohen novel, I did bail on it. It was awful, too. I mean, those of you who have stuck around know that when I say something was awful, it just means... It usually means, unless I think the writing was awful, and I don't, in the in the case of Leonard Cohen, I don't mean the writing was awful. I just didn't like it at all. So, you know, distill me from my words. I should really only say a book was terrible if I think it was poor quality. But I often say it when I mean that I hated it. It just wasn't a Sean book. So this Leonard Cohen was not a Sean book. It was typical white male asshole, those writers of the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s who could not have shuffled off this moral coil fast enough because they're all just such misogynistic, oversexed prose stylists. And Leonard Cohen, I'm sorry, you're now on that list. It was... Uh, so, so that happened. Whew. Now I will tell you about the books I finished. I finished two books this week, and one of them I wish to hell I'd bailed on, but it was a short little one. Uh, Buddy Read with Tina of... My Reading Companion, and Richard of Richard Reads. This terrible novel from Japan, Snow Country by Yasunari Kawabata. Uh, snowy atmosphere, and that's about it. Some might enjoy the snowy atmosphere and the moony atmosphere. Certainly our charmless protagonist, Shimamura, fetishized the snow and the moon too bad about human relationships. He didn't have any of those, but he lobbed on to some geisha, which is just a euphemism for hooker, believe me, in this story, who was a ditz and always drunk and completely obnoxious. But then he had his eye over there on uh, some other woman. We never did figure out why. But most importantly, why either of those women would pay him the slightest bit of attention. He was so freaking boring. What a stupid story! Hated it. One star. 
Ah, yes, yes, now I feel much calmer now. <laughs> this will not be a rant, but this was ended up being a disappointing read that I finished yesterday. My second novel by Cynthia Proper Seton, The Half Sisters. Um, it started out pretty good, and it had brilliant, beautifully heart-rending moments. But it was a failure of a novel. All of her worst flaws from the wonderful Sea Change of Angela Lewis, which Ange and I buddy read last year and which I loved in a five-star way, were writ large here, and there were some new flaws. So I don't care about spoilers because none of you should read this book particularly, but the two half-sisters, they were born the same year, maybe the same month, to do two different mothers. So their father was cheating on the the wife and ended up marrying his new lady but the two daughters were born uh, very close together and then they didn't spend a lot of time together as children but they did spend some these two sisters but they did spend some time together and then their father drowned in a boating accident or disappeared and he was a writer and then neither of the daughters have any emotional reaction that is visible in this narrative to their father's death and then they, they don't see each other for several years why have such a dramatic death early in the story and then it to play no role whatsoever in the novel? Because I kept holding out for that to circle back because in The Sea Change of Angela Lewis, the grandmother up and disappears one day and all of the immediate family don't seem too fussed about it and they just go on leading their very self-absorbed lives for a decade or two decades and then slowly they start to wonder whatever happened to grandma and they try to find her well I was waiting for something like that here to tie it together and because it didn't ever come up again I just thought really this is just the story of a complicated relationship between two women that are half sisters and there's jealousy and uh, affairs and women's liberation and all lots of good themes which occasionally gave rise to devastatingly emotionally powerful scenes some of which I will never forget but there's like three of those and the rest of it was clunky dialogue overwrought intellectual discussions about feminism and politics and this and that and blah, 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 um, that just didn't make for an engaging narrative at all so it's very disappointing I'm not giving up on Cynthia proper sentence she wrote at least one really excellent novel I assume there might be one or two others that I might enjoy but I do not at all, sadly, recommend The Half-Sisters. Three stars. I still feel like I had a good reading week, so hear me out, people. Hear me out. I have started how many? I believe I've started three new books. Last year, I tried the Simon Savage approach to incorporating more short stories into my reading life, but it didn't work. And his approach, it's genius, and it would work for most people, I think, is that every time you finish any book... Before you pick up the next novel or biography or whatever, pick up a, the collection of short stories that you have started and read the next story. And then once you've read that story, put it down and then pick up your book. And then the next time you finish whatever other book, read another story. And that way you will get a regular dose of short fiction in your reading life. It didn't work for me last year because I have so many buddy reads and they're so tightly scheduled that when one ends, the next day another one's beginning and there just wasn't ever time to do that. So I'm experimenting with a new approach, which is every day that I have a full day for reading and booktubing, I'm going to read at least one short story. That's typically Friday, but occasionally there's other days of the week because some of the, my classes I only teach twice a month or whatever, and certainly my weekend days are often free so I should be able to read one or two stories a week if I just do that and just make a concentrated effort that okay today's kind of an unstructured day start my reading with another short story so I have tried that I started a collection of short stories I've had on my shelf for a couple years from Ireland again I made a flippant comment about Irish fiction modern Irish fiction maybe not being for me and you know just disregard those I say a lot of hyperbolic things just because I'm a drama queen, but, you know, I will contradict myself the next day. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of wonderful Irish fiction, and I have read a whole bunch, but the last couple that I tried, and that was, uh, uh, oh, that was in my uh, worst Besties and Worsties video, because I really was disappointed by the Aidan Higgins novel and Henry Moore's novel. What was it called? Love? No. 
was really dry and boring in the similar way, which just makes me wonder, is there a strand of dry, desiccated Irish male prose that doesn't work for me? My top read last year was John Boyne's, uh, the year before last, was John Boyne's The Heart's Invisible Furies. And one of the worst novels I read last year was his novel, The Absolutist. So, but John Boyne sometimes works for him. Anyway, all of that being said, I have started this collection of short stories by Bernard, 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 Bernard McClaverty, Walking the Dog. Why is there a space between the M-A-C and the L? I understand that there are, th wow, every instance, it's, look at there. I don't understand that. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen that. So is it his middle name, Bernard Mac Laverty? It's, it's not Bernard McClaverty? If it's Bernard McClaverty, why on earth is there a space? Can somebody help me out here? That's fascinating. I didn't notice it before. Hey, well, no, this is just a really stupid mistake in this book. I checked his own personal uh, Bernard McClaverty's webpage. There is no space between the Mac and the Laverty. What an, what an inane mistake to make. I can't believe this happened. Anyway, this is a short story collection. I picked it up at a secondhand bookstore in Tokyo a couple of years ago, and I just pulled it off the shelf and started reading it. The first two stories were excellent. The third story was good. So two out of three were excellent. I'm enjoying it. I'll have maybe more to say when I finish. I find it really difficult to review short story collections. So anyway, you'll hear a little bit more about it later. But this is my experiment of getting more short fiction in my reading life. How do you get your short fiction in your reading life? Please leave a comment below. And because of the some Buddy Reed Bales, and I don't think I'm telling tales out of school to say that one of my fellow Balers on the William Golding novel was Heidi of my reading life. And she and I had a unscheduled but committed Buddy Reed that was going to happen at some point this year. So I touched base with her and she was game. And so we started it and it's going to be one of the best books that I read this month. It's a reread for me. It's a Western Canadian classic, but I haven't mentioned it on this channel, except in, a, in the book haul. And that is Wild Geese by Martha Ostenso. And I studied this at university, and just remember, all I really remember about that was that I really liked it. And I think I'm loving it even more this time. And so I'm buddy reading this with Heidi, and we're both have just sunk into it. It's just everything that... A lot of the bad reading experiences I've had so far in January were not, and maybe for Heidi too. So it is wonderful. It's set on a farm, and there's a kind of villainous father, but he's nuanced enough that it's not a black and white character, and he keeps his thumbs down on the whole family, and, he, and the teacher is boarding there, and blah, blah, blah. It's uh, wonderful. And Martha Ostenso, I'll talk about more about her life story, because it's quite fascinating when I do the review. I want to read more by her. I have incorporated a readathon, Read Your Shelf, into my TBR this month. I put the TBR video up yesterday, and uh, so you can check that out. But I started the first read, so I'm trying to do, I'll put, I'll put it up here. Here's the bingo card, and I'm going to do the top row. And for the gift prompt, I, yesterday I started reading this, Angel of Oblivion by Maja Hatterlap. And this is translated from the German by Tess Lewis. This is an ARC, but it was published by Archipelago Books 2016. I read maybe the first three chapters yesterday, and I really liked them. And Mata Haderlap comes from the Slovenian-speaking minority from Austria. And this story is about partisans from that ethnic group fighting against Hitler in World War II. Starting out good. And I have been wanting to read this for a long time, and I finally fit it in, thanks to Read Your Shelf. So those are the books that I've started, and they're going well. The other books that are in progress are going well. So yeah, I've had a really fantastic reading week. And next week's going to be even better, because I will be starting at least two buddy reads on Monday. This is a buddy read with Britta Bowler and Eric Carl Anderson, Lissa Evans's novel from last year, Old Baggage. It's about an old suffragette who, after the suffragettes won their won the day in around World War I in the UK, she was kind of at loose ends and didn't know what to do with herself. So 
I don't like tags on book covers, but this one is What Do You Do Next After You've Changed the World? And it's that story. So this was set in about 1930, and she just doesn't know what to do with herself. I assume it's going to be kind of a light, breezy read, and that's that fits the bill. And it's got a gorgeous... Look at this when you take the... It's, it's got a wonderful actual cover. And I hope I enjoyed it. It's my first Lisa Evans. Eric has read her novel Crooked Heart, I believe. And this is a prequel, I, I think. This is a prequel. So published later, but the story happens earlier. Prequel. Prequel, right? And I will be starting my next Barbara Pym novel and a, as a buddy read with Ange from Beyond the Pages, The Sweet Dove Died, starting Monday as well. That's a short one. We'll probably read it in a week, but I am so excited to have... Uh, to do my next Barbara Pym novel. Wait, 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 wait. I forgot to include this one. If I'm going to be participating in Britta Bowler's next read-along for her Nobel Women read-along book club, I better get started on this baby this week. Sigrid Unset's The Wreath, the first in a series entitled Christian Laverne's Daughter, Translated from the Swedish, maybe, by Tina Nunali. Is it the Swedish? I always get confused. Ah. From the Norwegian. And this is a story set in the 14th century. If you don't know about Britta's Nobel Women Read-Along Book Club, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. There's still time to join in. And if the Queen Mary biography, The Quest for Queen Mary by James Pope Hennessy, edited by Hugo Vickers, arrives in the mail in the coming week, I will start it immediately. And that's a buddy read with Leah from Calgary. I'm expecting it maybe next week, so that might also be coming up as well. But I have added uh, four new books to my January TBR. Those will be, I'm going to try to crowd those in at the end of the month and amp up my, my reading pace a little bit uh, between now and then. And uh, that all feels fabulous. So that is what it's been like in my reading life this week. How about yours? Thanks for watching. <laughs>